Welcome. Uh, we're going to get started, and as people continue to get their food, welcome to the Yale Law School Faculty Book Talk Series. This is a great event to kick off the spring semester. I'm Teresa Miguel Stearns, the director of your fabulous law library. And reflecting the breadth of our featured book this evening, we have a great variety of organizations co-sponsoring the event tonight, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank them. The Lillian Goldman Law Library, the Program for the Study of Reproductive Justice, and specifically Priscilla, and, Priscilla Smith and Heather Branch were instrumental in helping uh, 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 Professor Siegel and I pull this event together. The Gruber Program for Global Justice and Women's Rights, and quite a few student groups. Um, thank you all for co-sponsoring the American Constitutional, the, sorry, the American Constitution Society, the Black Law Students Association, Outlaws at YLS, the Yale Law Student Alliance for Reproductive Justice, and Yale Law Women. Thank you all. Tonight we feature a fantastic panel of scholars who are here to discuss their book, uh, Reproductive Rights and Justice Stories, which we have in the library, of course, multiple copies, alongside a broader discussion of the future of the law in this area. I will introduce our moderator, who will then in introduce our panelists and get this, dis this discussion going. We are scheduled to go at, uh, until 7.30 this evening. Our moderator is Emily Bazelon, a 2000 graduate of Yale Law School. She is a lecturer in law and Truman Capote fellow here at Yale Law School. She is also a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine and author of two national bestsellers, Charged, the, mo the Movement to Transform American Prosecution and End Mass Incarceration and Sticks and Stones, Defeating the Culture of Bullying and Rediscovering the Power of Character and Empathy. She co-hosts a popular podcast, The Slate Political Gab Fest. Emily. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you all so much for coming tonight, kind of cold uh, January evening, but also a really fitting occasion since this is obviously the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. So we are here to talk about this remarkable book, which is um, full of stories and knowledge. And if you pick it up and read it, we'll take you down pathways um, that I think are new to you. Um, three of our panelists edited this book, Reba Siegel, Melissa Murray, and Kate Shaw and Linda Greenhouse and Doug Mujame are contributors to it. I'm gonna very briefly introduce them in a sort of such a brief way that it's not like law school tradition, but I want us to have to use this time um, for talking. So Melissa and Kate are guests. Melissa um, teaches con law and family law and crim law and reproductive rights and justice at NYU. She is an author of Cases on Reproductive Rights and Justice, the first case book to cover the field of reproductive rights and justice. And she and Kate look especially nice. They still have their TV makeup on. They're doing lots of TV and radio commentary in this impeachment season. Um, Kate is a professor at Cardoza Law School. Before that, she worked in the White House Counsel's Office as a special assistant to the president and associate counsel to the president. And she also clerked on the Supreme Court for Justice John Paul Stevens. Um, Linda Greenhouse, who is next to Melissa, I'm sure needs no introduction, but she is the Joseph Goldstein Lecturer in Law and Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence here. She covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times from 1978 to 2008, winning a Pulitzer along the way. And now she writes a bi-weekly op-ed column on law um, as a contributing columnist at the New York Times. Reva Siegel is a law professor here at Yale. She has written countless law review articles, um, a new one just out in the Yale Law Journal, I think, right? Um, on the 19th Amendment, called The 19th Amendment and the Democratization of, Fa of, of Family. Um, and her books include Before Roe versus Weed, Voices That Shaped the Abortion Debate Before the Supreme Court's Ruling, which she wrote with Linda, I saved it for now, um, and The Constitution in 2020, which she edited with Jack Balkan. And Doug, who is uh, between Kate and Melissa, teaches family law, legal ethics, law, and sexuality, and con law here at Yale. Before coming here, he was at UCLA, where he was the faculty director of the Williams Institute, which is a research institute on sexual orientation and gender identity law and public policy. He's the co-author of Cases and Materials on Sexuality, Gender Identity, and the Law. Um, and he is currently doing some lobbying in Hartford that would, um, to push the Connecticut legislature to pass the Connecticut Parentage Act, which would provide a pathway, an equal pathway for parenthood to LGBT parents and other non-biological parents. 
Okay. Um, so let's start um, with Melissa and Kate. So this is um, a volume of stories. It uses cases in all of their depth and richness and sometimes complicated nature to illuminate the crucial issues in reproductive law and justice um, that we are very much grappling with here in this um, Supreme Court season. So talk to us a little bit about these stories, why you chose to focus this book on stories, and what are the lessons that um, can be gleaned from some of the individuals whose lives that you write about and then gathered other people to write about? Well, first, thanks so much for having us. It's really a treat to be here with all of you tonight, and special thanks to Scylla Smith for organizing all of us and getting us together along with Teresa. Um, obviously, we all read cases, you all read cases all the time. Um, one of the disadvantages, I think, of reading cases is that the court's treatment, and courts generally, their treatment of the disposition of the case sort of divests it of the human color behind it. Um, it's hard to see the actual people, the stakes for those individuals, the background context in which the dispute arose and was settled. All of that um, becomes a little colorless in the judicial treatment of the situation. What also I think becomes a little hard to recognize is the way in which common themes actually surface over cases that may present quite disparate disputes, right? So for example, um, in teaching family law for over 13 years now, it has always struck me that a lot of the cases that I read, whether they're about contract disputes between family members or a constitutional case or criminal cases um, involving the regulation of some aspect of family life, they are at bottom questions about reproductive capacity, about regulating sex, about regulating reproduction, about the effort to reproduce a particular model of gender or family that is gendered as well. And one of the things we wanted to do with this particular project was to show the through line through all of these cases. Like these cases, they are about very different things, but they are all at bottom cases about the regulation of reproduction, the regulation of sexuality, the reproduction of certain kinds of sexual mores. And so we deliberately do not focus exclusively on abortion cases or contraception cases, although those are obviously big parts of the reproductive rights canon. Uh, we also want to showcase other things, sterilization cases, cases concerning assisted reproductive technologies, which haven't really been considered part of the reproductive rights canon, but should be going forward because they too are about efforts to identify particular a particular narrative about what is the ideal kind of reproductive life, who are the members of ideal families. And so taking a kind of broader lens, looking at these cases in this broader valence, I think highlights some of the race, gender, sexual orientation, class dynamics that are happening and personal dynamics that I think you otherwise would not get. Um, and so maybe I'll just add to that by highlighting a couple of the stories that are in our collection that were authored by folks not on this panel. Um, so the first is Maya Banyan's chapter on a district court case from 1978 in California uh, called Madrigal versus Quilligan. And then Kiara Bridges' chapter on the 1980 case Harris versus McRae. Harris versus McRae may be slightly more familiar. Madrigal is almost certainly not. Um, uh, but they both have stories that very much bear telling. Um, the first uh, case involves um, essentially coerced sterilization of Mexican-American women in a public hospital in California. Um, the case resulted in basically a loss in the damages phase of litigation uh, in the context of this class action by a group of women who had been involuntarily sterilized in this public hospital. Um, but it really catalyzed reforms to sterilization practice, both in the state of California and nationwide. Um, so it really inspired a movement and actual substantive legal change, but the case itself resulted in only partial victory um, and kind of remediation for the plaintiffs in the case. Um, and a related case, although it maybe isn't um, at first blush obvious why it's so related, is Harris versus McCray. So Harris, of course, is the 1980 case in which the Supreme Court five to four upholds the constitutionality of the Hyde Amendment, right, restricting the use of federal funds for abortion services. Um, you know, it's only seven years after Roe. The court comes within one vote of finding that a constitutional right to an abortion entails, um, for folks who can't otherwise afford to exercise that right, government-provided uh, abortion care, right, say for Medicaid recipients who are otherwise receiving their 
uh, health care um, through at least in part federal subsidies. Um, but an interesting dynamic in the Harris sort of backstory, which isn't at all present in the case, right, to Melissa's point about how much is erased in the Supreme Court's telling of these stories, um, is that there are all of these connections between opposition to the Hyde Amendment um, and opposition to sterilization abuse. So at the time, it is the case that the federal government, while refusing to fund abortions for Medicaid recipients, is funding, funding sterilization. Um, and promoting sterilization as a fa family planning mechanism for women who can't access abortion. So you can't get an abortion to get pregnant. Um, the government will not subsidize um, your exercise of the abortion right, um, but it will happily subsidize your sterilization. And so both of these cases, I think, speak to this interesting dynamic that we don't always think about in the context of debates around choice, which is the coercive power of the state um, to compel certain populations that are obviously raised <laughs> Uh, and gendered and classed in particular ways um, to avoid altogether the having of children as opposed to, to creating obstacles to the accessing of you know, abortion rights, which is, a, I think, a, a, the way we often think about um, at least abortion debates in a kind of reproductive choice frame. And so I think those are both really interesting and important stories kind of uh, in this larger collection. Yeah. yeah, just to underscore what Melissa and Kate have said, a number of these stories are about uh, people who want, to have, who want to become parents, who want to become mothers. And for instance, the Young Against UPS uh, case about the rights of pregnant workers uh, is a, quite a recent uh, Supreme Court case. And so it's really reproductive justice writ large. Uh, we tend to think of it as abortion or birth control, but I think the, the way this book is set up is very clearly much richer than that. So that's a perfect segue. So the book is framed as being a story about reproductive rights and justice, which is a kind of recent reframing, I think. And Tariva, this is something you've thought a lot about, the language and kind of um, overarching ideas about um, not just abortion, but all these issues that affect um, people's right to parent, their ability to parent um, when they decide to become parents. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by reproductive rights and justice? Well, I'm going to first sort of loop in. Melissa, did you want to talk about your case book at all, or should I just sort of dig in? Dig in. Okay. Dig in. All right. Um, so, I, I mean, I would say that over the last, um, I want to say 20 years, 20 years, there's been really an effort to um, push back critically at a reproductive rights frame that has been um, focused on the question of state control over decisions around uh, abortion or abortion concept, uh, contraception only, and to expand the frame in a number of ways to focus on um, the entire range of both state and non-state forms of power that bear on communities' efforts to uh, bear uh, and raise <laughs> um, uh, healthy families and healthy and flourishing families. And that larger frame, uh, which is concerned about the ability to raise flourishing families, might be understood as this larger reproductive justice frame. And that reproductive justice frame is attentive to the intersecting uh, kinds of uh, power inequalities um, along axes, not only of gender, but race and class and sexuality, um, and nationality, um, and many forms of inequality come to bear on the life chances and life choices that individuals and communities uh, make uh, in the question of how it is um, that one um, comes to have intimacy, find, um, uh, uh, make and form families and bring new, community, new generations into the world. And this book uh, was put together uh, with attention to both the older, more traditional reproductive rights canon and this more expansive uh, attention to reproductive justice questions. And it pays attention even to the older reproductive rights questions in this expanded reproductive justice frame, I think it's fair to say. Um, and uh, I would say that um, 
the book also, I want to raise the other axis of the book, but is, is really attentive to the way that law is made um, in, in the elaboration of, you know, the development of the law in all of these areas is not just through courts, that law is forged through many different um, bases of the state interacting with people, but it's, it's top down in that way, uh, but it's also bottom up from people making claims on uh, their communities and on, on, the, on forms of state power in many different settings and locations. And the stories are told in a way that is totally court focused. There are about court cases, but also very attentive to the ways in which <clears throat> the, the, the progress of <clears throat> the development of the law is shaped by ordinary people struggling uh, to essentially assert their claims in a variety of settings, sometimes the formal setting of a trial, but often in other kinds of and contexts. Did you want to? I also wanted, so Kristen Luker from the University of California, Berkeley, and I wrote a case book, um, Cases on Reproductive Rights and Justice in 2014. And our goal was all of the things that Riva just mentioned, um, you sort of unite the field, reproductive rights, with this reproductive justice movement that had been going on for many years in communities of color and was not really part of academic discourse in most law schools. Like lots of law schools had reproductive rights courses. Many didn't have a case book, so there were just, you know, instructors putting together their own materials, which was an impediment to having it be offered more regularly. So we wanted to write a case book, one, to legitimate the field, two, to legitimate the field using the intellectual engagement of women of color, which has almost never been part of the law school endeavor, but which we thought was important. And I think it really has gotten a lot of traction and maybe in ways that were perhaps unexpected. So I would call attention to Justice Thomas's concurrence last spring in the Box versus Planned Parenthood case, which was a challenge to two Indiana abortion restrictions. The court denied cert on one provision, which is basically an anti-discrimination provision for fetuses, um, I think fetuses may have may have had more rights in Indiana than people, um, non-discrimination rights. And then another provision that related to the funereal disposal of fetal remains. And in that concurrence, um, Justice Thomas chided his colleagues for denying certiorari on the non-discrimination provision and said that at some point we would have to get to this question, this question of um, selective termination of pregnancies based on race, disability, gender, and whatnot. And in doing so, he specifically linked the birth control movement to a history of eugenics. And much has been made about Margaret Sanger's ties to eugenesis and the birth control movement's early ties to eugenics. Um, but then he noted that while Margaret Sanger had not been necessarily speaking of abortion particularly, all of the arguments that could have been made um, to denounce birth control in that context could also be made with equal, if not more, force in the context of abortion. And he noted that abortion was perhaps even more rife with the potential for genocide, deracination, than birth control was. And I think that is also a kind of reproductive justice lens, like not the lens I think we are intending, but again, linking this question of reproductive rights to the broader issue of justice for particular communities, um, communities that historically have been marginalized, he is tapping into that as well. So, I mean, one of the things that I want to be attentive to as we move forward is that these things get put out in the ether and they can be used in lots of different ways. And one of the projects of this book, I think, is to refute with perhaps better history than Justice Thomas has available to him exactly how this is working and, and how it doesn't. Right, so Justice Thomas takes this idea of justice and then he links eugenics to abortion and would look at the higher rate of abortion among African-American women and say that that's evidence of race discrimination and oppression as opposed injustice. to injustice as opposed to an exercise of a right of, of liberty. Um, and then the reproductive justice framework that um, the one way I think about it is that what do you need to not have a baby? Who gets to decide that? Who do you get to be to have real access to the decision not to have a baby? But on the spectrum, what do you need to have a baby? What does the state need to provide that 
opens that possibility to as many people as possible and then makes um, people able to provide for their children in a way that leads to good outcomes. So, Revo, why don't you jump uh, can in? Can I just say something? <laughs> I was teeing it up for you to say that. I, I, I really, I, I actually don't particularly want to dialogue with Justice Thomas on this, but it, there is an important analytical distinction to make between the use of coercive state power uh, to control the choices of individuals in reproducing and the choices that individual women make uh, to exercise, uh, to make decisions about whether or not to end pregnancies. I think it's really important to start by disaggregating those two cases. It could be that um, individual women are making those choices at a higher rate, and if they had different resources, they would differently make them, and that it's really important to get them those better resources so as to enable them to make those choices at a different rate. And I totally support that possibility. And Not necessarily what Justice Thomas is. But not <laughs> using the word eugenics to describe the problem. I, I, I'm not. I'm just suggesting that these terms, like this idea of a reproductive justice frame, can be manipulated and used in the same way any kind of rights language could be used. And part of our project is to push back. Like our, the frame that we are talking about is actually different and talks about the conditions in which you raise your family, which is a lot of what you have been discussing in pro-choice life. Like, what are the affirmative obligations that the state has to individuals to provide them with the conditions in which they can make these choices with full autonomy? I'll say something about, I will say something about this other frame. So what is this pro-choice life frame that Melissa is, is teeing up to, for you. Yeah, to, to, to say something about? It. So um, <coughs> I have, as part and parcel of the RJ perspective, uh, been um, for some time now urging the importance of not trying to talk about the abortion issue solely in a single issue frame and thinking it really important, including in this dialogue with Justice Thomas, to expand the frame so as to look at the larger set of, to look at the question in a larger social framework. I mean, from the very beginning I ever has said any, wrote anything on the question, I thought it important to understand what was going on in a larger social framework. Why are people um, trying to regulate the question and why are they making the choices they're making? Ask and answer those questions in a larger social framework. Um, and I think if we do, um, we could help people make, uh, uh, support them in making the choices they want to make. That's one thing, get them the resources and the education, the resources and everything they need to make um, the most self-determining choices they and, their, and they and their families want to make. That's number one. But number two, we can also better understand the reasons why particular actors may want to regulate the practices that they do. And so what is this pro-choice life frame? Let's look at the, the choices that um, a state has to support life, starting from sex ed, contraception, um, the abortion question, to health care, to work family accommodation, to income assistance, all the way across the whole gamut. And you'll notice that there are actually lots of ways to support new life. You can help people who don't want to um, have children uh, avoid pregnancies that they don't want to have um, and only have pregnancies that they want to have. Uh, and you can also have people support people who want to bring healthy pregnancies into the world achieve that end, right? Um, by the policy choices that any jurisdiction makes. There's like a whole gamut of policy choices available, right? And when you look at the question in that larger framework, you'll see that in fact, states in the United States, in fact, make different choices about how they support life. All the time, they're making different choices about how they support life. That's what's going on. And in fact, they have different views about how to support life. Progressive jurisdictions make a completely different set of choices about the ways they support life than do southern states or conservative jurisdictions. And in fact, it turns out that the states that have the most appetite for abortion restrictions have the least interest in health care expansions and um, accommodating pregnant workers and sex ed and making contraception available and all of that. It turns out that there's almost like a mixed map. It's like opposites. It's kind of crazy, actually. 
And so then when you have this wider frame, you can start getting into a serious dialogue about what do you mean when you're saying that you're pro, what exactly are you talking about when you're saying that you're pro-life? So this larger frame lets you get very serious in probing what this pro-life claim is about. What are you doing when you're restricting a woman's choices and you're not providing sex ed, access to contraception, health care, provision of actual means to keep income supports and all of that so as to be able to have a healthy pregnancy and raise children? What exactly is, what, what is, is that pro-life? <laughs> Why won't you make those other choices? What are those other values intervening to stop you from making those choices? So it lets you be critical, right? And it also shows that progressives actually are committed to life. And it may also help you do coalition politics. It may help you find common ground if you can't agree on the abortion issue. So I would like to get into it with Justice Thomas, actually. <laughs> okay. I'll stop right there. I consider that the RJ framework. Um, Linda and Doug, I want to bring you in to talk a little bit about the Supreme Court. So we have this case on the court's docket in March, June Medical Services, um, which is a nail biter for the pro-choice movement. It is in some ways a repeat of a case called Whole Woman's Health from 2016, in which the case, the court then, with Justice Kennedy on it, by a five to four vote, struck down a restriction um, that was shutting down clinics in Texas, requiring admitting privileges for abortion providers to hospitals. This very same um, restriction is now um, the subject of June Medical Services. Um, and so the pro choice movement, I think, has a lot to lose, a lot um, at stake in this case. It's also a really hard case for people who want to believe that the Supreme Court is not just a political institution. Um, in which the changing of the guard um, determines outcomes um, in such a kind of um, non-evidence-based way, I would argue. Um, Linda, can you jump in and tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about this case and what you think, um, what you think about it? Yeah, so, so we have to look at the, at the Fifth Circuit, <coughs> which is a circuit that includes both Texas, which was called Women's Health, and Louisiana, which is June Medical. So the Fifth Circuit, uh, for quite a long time, was at war with the Supreme Court's abortion jurisprudence to the extent that, as you recall, Planned Parenthood against Casey, which uh, more or less reaffirmed Roe against Wade in 1992, set up this undue burden standard, and how do you decide whether something's an undue burden? And the Fifth Circuit had announced that basically is just rational basis. It's whatever the state wants is okay. Now, it was the dissenters in Planned Parenthood against Casey who were asking for rational basis. They lost that case. But the Fifth Circuit thought otherwise, and the circuit was rebuked in Whole Woman's Health on this five to three decision, Justice Scalia having died, uh, and written by Justice Breyer. The very same Fifth Circuit turns around and upholds the identical law in Louisiana. Uh, both laws were modeled after um, proposals coming out of a very smart uh, anti-abortion group in Chicago, Americans United for Life, these admitting privileges in requirement in states where hospitals simply will not give admitting privileges to doctors who perform abortions. One of the doctors in Louisiana have been trying to get admitting privileges for five years. So it's a way of shutting down the abortion infrastructure while at the same time claiming that your motive is to protect women's health because of course nobody wants uh, to have abortion clinics that are substandard. So we're just protecting women's health. Uh, so this really puts it to the court, doesn't it? And the Fifth Circuit tried to distinguish whole women's health in its uh, June medical decision failed on any logical basis. Uh, you know, they didn't say much more than that was Texas and this is Louisiana. Their opinion makes actually no sense. So uh, the case came up to the Supreme Court uh, just about a year ago uh, on a stay application by the clinic because the clinic having lost in the Fifth Circuit, uh, the clinic, basically Louisiana would have been down to, I believe, one abortion provider had the court not issued a stay. 
to issue a stay. It takes five votes in the Supreme Court to issue a stay. Uh, so the five included uh, the Chief Justice. Uh, the four were uh, quite silent about this, except for the newest justice, Justice Kavanaugh, who wrote a, uh, an opinion explaining why he didn't want to grant the stay. He said, you know, uh, it's not going to take effect immediately. It's going to take a few weeks. And the doctors should just go back and try harder. And it was clear, I think, that what Brett Kavanaugh was trying to do was position himself as the kind of reasonable man in the middle. You know, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, not, not just totally dissenting. I just want to give the doctors a little more chance and the state a little more time. And, you know, he succeeded in presenting himself as the man in the middle. Because if you go back and look at the mainstream news coverage of that stay application and its outcome, you will see Brett Kavanaugh presented as, you know, the kind of reasonable, qualified, whatever. That's my real fear about this case, I have to tell you, which is that I don't think this case is going to prove to be a vehicle for quote, overturning Roe against Wade, whatever Roe against Wade is today, and we can talk about that. I think it's going to be one more incremental step on the road to that functional outcome. But I think because the court will not be overturning Roe, the American public will not understand what game is really afoot here. If the court affirms the Fifth Circuit on some phony distinction, you know, we're not overturning whole women's health, that's still good law, but Louisiana is different for this, that, or the other reason. You know, uh, shorter traveling times, smaller state, large, smaller fraction of women who are directly affected by this. And, and that's, I, I predict that's going to be the game. And I also predict that people are going to fall for it. And so it's incumbent on all of us, whether we're writers or pundits or citizens or have neighbors and have family members, to make clear that we know what is going on at the Supreme Court. Can okay. I just say one quick thing about that? The other possibility, I think, um, in addition to this kind of strained effort that's sort of disingenuous to distinguish this case from the Holman's Health, would be to do what the state of Louisiana has asked it to do, which is so the state filed this conditional cross petition asking the court to find that these clinics didn't actually have third party standing at all. Um, and that was not, I don't think, in any fair way, certainly wasn't argued before. Louisiana like, definitely disclaimed that argument below. The Fifth Circuit had like a sentence saying that the clinics had standing, but it wasn't the kind of pressed or passed upon language um, that is usually sort of invoked to ask whether an issue has been preserved for appellate review. Like, I think it's very difficult to see how that's satisfied in this case, and yet the court took that and added that question to its consideration. So I think another and potentially even more diabolical way to uphold this law, but in a way that I think has all kinds of ripple effects for other abortion litigation, um, not just about you know these admitting privileges requirement, those alone would have, I mean, that would have a huge impact uh, in a lot of other states outside of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. But to say that um, you know clinics and physicians um, can't actually bring these cases at all um, would just make it extraordinarily difficult to challenge a range of restrictive laws in every state that has them. And that, I think, from the perspective of kind of public, you know, response and popular mobilization, it's like, you know, arcane standing ruling would be even harder to get people fired up about than a strained, you know, distinguishing of this 2016 case. So I think no, that's you're absolutely right. I'll just say one, one more thing. Uh, something happened uh, at the court yesterday uh, that I actually don't know what to make of it, but Louisiana is trying. So Whole Woman's Health, uh, the majority opinion of Whole Woman's Health basically weighs the benefits and the burdens and says, uh, this admitting privileges requirement uh, places a, a large burden in the sense of huge obstacle uh, to access to abortion. And the benefit is slight to non-existent because there's no health benefit that comes from having doctors with admitting privileges. Mm -hmm. Louisiana has tried very hard in this litigation to maintain that the abortion clinics in Louisiana happen to be terrible, dangerous, whatever, whatever. And they try to file uh, a sealed bunch of stuff at the court that uh, was going to go into various <coughs> phony problems. You know, they didn't fill out this line in this register, and they, you know. But new material, not tested at all. New material. Below, like first instance um, factual and stuff. And they had to do this yeah. by motion. They get 
court's permission to file it, and uh, the court denied permission. So but, like, can we say, but the, the, they, are, they relied on some of it in their opening brief. So well, the denial did. of permission is like the ship has kind of sailed. Yeah. Unless they, they didn't rule on whether the request to, re to file a newly redacted brief, did they? Because <clears throat> the clinics that brought this challenge also asked Louisiana to be forced to file a new brief redacting the references that it made. Because it filed its brief referencing this uh, supplemental appendix at the same time as it filed the request to, to lodge it, I guess. Um, do you know whether they ruled on that, the request to, to, to file a new redacted brief? No, I don't think so. So then it's in there, you know, like it's... <coughs> Even if the appendices aren't in, the, rep the, the brief contains references to this. Well, the told me, of course, not completely asleep at the switch. Okay. Right? That's not <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> so I think it seems like we're, there are a bunch of concerns with this case. One is erosion of rights versus overturning of rights and the way in which that can fool people or can feel like a sort of stealth attack. And another has to do with who gets to sue um, when a state passes um, a restrictive law. And then obviously what's at stake here is access to abortion clinics remaining open in states that are hostile um, to these rights. Life. We don't have time to talk about it. In the book, for those of you who are interested, there's a wonderful account. I don't know if you know who Carrie Franklin is. Um, there's a wonderful story about whole women's health and how the path uh, that Americans United for Life um, made towards developing these trap laws and basically the precedent that that it's going to be toppled by this case. And there's another one about Casey and what it looked like when it when the court nearly overturned Roe once. So this is sort of basically where we're sitting now, but 20 years before. So there, there are actually interesting stories from the inside of the court, um, sort of what these worlds were sitting on, what they're made of. But we should keep moving. Yes. Um, so, Doug, can I bring you in to talk a little bit about the lessons and perspectives of the marriage equality <coughs> movement? So that was a movement that incrementally moved in a rights-providing um, and rights-beneficial direction, where you see first the Massachusetts Supreme Court and I think 2000 say that the Massachusetts state constitution provided for an equal right to marriage. And then you see um, some action in other state courts at the same time as legislative campaigns and ballot measures and efforts to use more direct, um, demo directly democratic methods to expand rights. Then you see federal court um, cases start coming up. And by the time the Supreme Court rules, I would argue a lot of the work has already been done. Roe took an opposite approach. Um, and I wonder how you think about those differences. Yeah, so um, thanks, Emily. So I felt like I was um, here with a better seat than all of you just listening to the same <laughs> conversation, which is great. I, yes. So, um, so, I mean, I'm kind of an oddball on the panel because um, my story in the book is on a family law case, on an LGBT family law case, and so it's not um, explicitly a constitutional case, it's not a case in federal court, it's a case in state court, um, and it is a case about who is a parent. Um, and and so it's it's an issue that's following on from questions of marriage equality. And so in many ways, the marriage equality movement laid the groundwork for the kind of work that's done in that case, which is Brooke SB versus Elizabeth ACC from the New York Court of Appeals, which is the high court in New York. Um, so the LGBT movement did have this sort of multi-dimensional strategy in which they were focused on legislatures, um, uh, the public, and courts, and primarily focused on the state level. And to the extent there was constitutional litigation, it was state constitutional litigation so that if a state court ruled in their favor, there was no basis on which the US Supreme Court would take the case. So um, it's easy to, to think now of like Windsor and Obergefell as these critical moments where the US Supreme Court is helping LGBT people, which is true to some extent, but all of the groundwork for that um, was laid really in states, which Justice Kennedy um, uh, reflects on in Obergefell. I, I do think one thing about Obergefell that's interesting is that everyone acts like what the court was doing was just validating some consensus that had emerged. But in fact, most states still <coughs> prohibited same-sex marriage and had constitutional amendments prohibiting it. And, this, and, and then you had a bunch of federal courts in the wake of Windsor striking down those constitutional amendments and the federal courts of appeals that did so. You had the cert petitions go to the court and the court denies cert in those cases. So the court itself brought into being the world in which it could say marriage for same-sex couples is lawful in a majority of states. Um, 
and uh, that uh, those states were not saying possibly yes. though quietly right yes i mean south carolina was not wanting to allow same-sex couples to marry right they were forced to and so it wasn't until the sixth circuit went the other way that then you had something and by the time then the court's deciding oh it looks like this outlier of michigan and ohio and tennessee and kentucky um but in fact you know indiana was you know um kicking and screaming as it was dragged to recognize same-sex couples marriages um so so it's a complicated story i think in some ways but what comes out of that is i think relevant to this is that you still have states that aren't so into same-sex couples marrying and um and so they are doing other things that actually constrain the family relationships of lgbt people and indiana is a good example because um they have been trying now since marriage to um, to deny um, the marital presumption to same-sex couples. So when a, when a woman gives birth to a child and she's <clears throat> married, um, the law in every state presumes that her husband is the father of that child and treats him as the legal father. Um, and Indiana law says uh, when a married woman gives birth to a child, her husband is presumed to be the biological father of that child. Um, and Indiana said, we're not applying this to lesbian couples because you're not the biological parent of the child. Um, problem is, Indiana does nothing to see whether um, the man who's married to the woman is the biological father. And um, just last Friday, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals had been sitting on this case for th more than three years, um, actually issued an opinion, um, Judge Easterbrook, and Judge Sykes was on the panel as well, saying this is unconstitutional. Indiana has to apply the marital presumption. Now, there's some weird stuff in that opinion as well, including referring to sperm donors as biological fathers. But um, for the principle that this isn't a way you can continue to treat same-sex couples badly. Um, and so a lot has come from marriage. But the, the case that I talk about actually involves unmarried couples. And so one concern, a concern that Melissa has raised in her work, is um, whether the campaign for same-sex marriage simply um, shored up divisions between marital and non-marital families such that um, we are going to feel even more comfortable saying that um, non-marital families don't get rights and benefits and, and children born into non-marital families don't have the same equal status um, as children born in marital families. And here's where we might disagree a bit. I think the, the story about adult relationships has been one in which um, we still are in a world in which unmarried couples um, don't have the kinds of rights and obligations that get extended to married couples, so that might be changing. Um, but for non-marital children, in some ways, marriage has, in some states at least, um, fueled the recognition of um, the children born to unmarried parents. And the Brooke SB case is an example of that. So in that case, New York for many years had law that said, if you're not a biological or adoptive parent, you're not a legal parent. And there were cases involving lesbian couples in New York in which the couple has a child with donor sperm, raise the child together for 12 years, break up, and the non-biological mother is a legal stranger to that child. And that continued to be the law, and lower courts felt constrained by that 1991 Court of Appeals ruling. And in Brooke SB, you had a case like that, where a couple had a child together, they you know, chose the sperm donor together, um, uh, went to all the medical appointments together, uh, the non-bio mom uh, and the bio mom both took parental leave, non-bio mom became primary caregiver of the child, bio mom worked, and um, they break up and non-bio mom is a legal stranger. And Lambda Legal ends up getting involved. Um, the, um, the couple uh, was on state support. The non-bio mom could not get counsel. The only reason the case gets appealed is because the um, lower court appointed a guardian, and an attorney for the child. Um, and that attorney for the child appealed because the lower court said, um, you are, this woman is clearly a parent to this child, um, but I'm constrained by the law. And so she's a legal stranger under the law, but this is a moral problem. Um, the, the trial court talked about testimony of the child seeing a picture of his non-biological mother and crying. And like, there was just a lot of moving stuff in it. 
but the attorney for the child appeals and then Lambda Legal gets involved and it eventually goes to the Court of Appeals where they say that 25 years of precedent has harmed children in this state and, and, and it treats um, same-sex couples um, unequally. And it cites to marriage equality as a basis on which to say we no longer live in a world in which we can premise our laws on heterosexuality. So it says the, the old regime in which those, the old case was decided was a world that heterosexuality was the paradigm. Obergefell and marriage equality mean that same-sex couples um, have to be treated like equal members of the community. And that means that that heterosexual premise of the parentage law can no longer stand. And so the court articulates this view that um, for a non-biological parent who intended to be a parent with the other person and then parent to the child, that person has a claim to being deemed a legal parent of the child. And that applies to different sex couples too, but its primary importance was for these same sex couples. That to me is a critical issue post marriage equality. And it's one in which you see LGBT advocates moving, you know, they were always doing this work, but now they're doing it with new arguments and they're not at all interested in being in the federal courts and certainly not interested in having a Justice Kavanaugh or anyone on the Supreme Court review <laughs> this kind of decision. So these are state law questions in which constitutional stakes are clear, but they turn on questions of state family law being decided by state courts and you know pressing these things in state courts and state legislatures um, in places where people want to treat equally families formed by LGBT people. I mean, I just want to say that this is when you think about the RJ lens, this is hugely the future of this field. Um, so this is who, who counts as a family? Who's like, how do we know who's the parent here? And this is, this matters in same sex and different sex families. It's, you know, and um, the, the law that's getting made here, um, the question also of what resources do families have? Um, all of this is going to get determined in legislatures as well as courts, and it's it's law that's going to be made on the ground, and that's not just all a federal courts kind of question. And it plain, plainly is not just a question of what happens to Roe. You know, so when you expand the frame in the ways that we're talking about here, and you read the stories in this book you definitely see that it totally mapped the principles that are at stake in a case um, like Roe or a case like Madrigal, where we started out all the way at the beginning of the panel, they cut across all of these cases, but they're not totally in the control, for example, of Justice Kavanaugh, you know, and, 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 and in very practical ways. They're, and it matters in terms of thinking about the future of the law. Yeah, I'll also just, if I could say, so they don't have the same salience as the abortion issue has too. And so you actually find that you have to do a lot of education for people, but they don't, a lot of people don't appreciate the issues that are there. Um, so Connecticut is currently a state, as some of you know, in which if a same-sex couple who's unmarried breaks up, the non-biological mother is a legal stranger to the child if she didn't adopt. Um, and Connecticut shouldn't be a state like that. Um, and and we, so and that's true of, of children in non-marital families in which one of the parents is not their biological parent. So it means it's true for different sex couples who are unmarried who use donor sperm as well. And we're trying to get Connecticut to change that law. And it's a big lift, but but it's not a lift in terms of people are dug in against it. It's like more about practical stuff and logistical stuff and worrying about unintended consequences. And it's about educating people because even the chief family court judge in Connecticut didn't realize that was the law because he never saw those couples. Why didn't he see those couples? Because they had no, the non-bio mom had no standing to get into his court. And if they call us, we tell them, you know, you can't, you'd have to litigate this up to the Connecticut Supreme Court. Um, so it's about educating people and seeing what counts as a family. And people have intuitions that these folks are families and they, and so it's about getting to a, a legislative framework that can do what you need it to do. Um, so before we take some questions, Reva and Linda, um, the story you tell in the book is about Roe versus Wade, um, and it seems fitting to tell some of that story um, since it's the anniversary. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so what we try to do, and Reva will jump in, uh, was 
not tell the conventional story that people learned that, you know, Sarah Weddington woke up one day and, you know, recruited, you know, the, the kind of personalized story about the Roe litigation. She's the we, lawyer, right? Say Sarah it? Weddington is the lawyer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We step way back and talk about the various movements that uh, converged, uh, starting in the medical community and in the elite legal community, and a little bit later in the feminist community, uh, to bring the abortion issue uh, to the fore, not in the courts beginning, but in the multi-pronged, in the legislatures, in, in state courts. Uh, and it was almost a happenstance that Roe against Wade, the case, was the first in the queue that made it to the Supreme Court. There was a case that was born right here in Yale Law School, a case called Abley against Markle, commonly known as Women Against Connecticut, in which YLS students recruited more than a thousand plaintiffs to bring what would have been a fabulous case, uh, but Roe got there first. Um, so there's, a, we, we try to tell a, a, a social movement story, a multi-pronged effort to compel the issue into people's consciousness, and you know we think it, it was a, a fresh and a different way of, of relaying uh, how we got to where we are uh, today. A couple other things I would throw out there. Um, the law, there was no law at the time that the, well, I mean, one of the things that's, that's moving to look at this material from the earlier period is that it's people um, pushing back at law that seemed unjust to them at a time when there is no law on the books to uh, lay claim to. There's not a court there that's, um, you know, there's no encrusted law on which they're, they're making claims. So it's really ground up stuff. And um, I, I'm, there's also, equal protection law isn't what it was. And so there's a lot of equality claiming in this. There's uh, uh, what basically looks like an RJ kind of set of objections to the uh, health harms of a criminal abortion regime that um, terribly bore on uh, women of color more than women of means um, in terms of what, hap what happened to you if you had got an, uh, an illegal abortion in those years. Um, and uh, because it's before Washington against Davis and all those good cases that y'all learned in con law, um, it's sort of credible maybe <laughs> for them to be making equality arguments in the mix with liberty arguments in the mix. And they're making claims that it's a violation of equal protection on grounds of wealth inequality and race inequality as well as sex inequality. All of those kinds of arguments are in the mix all together. It's not just a privacy argument. There is a privacy argument there, but it's not the leading kind of argument that, that is in the mix. Both in the Abramowitz case in New York, which Linda covered in the New York Times Magazine in that period, it's just like, out there reporting on this case, which nobody, it's like a constitutional argument for, like, but there's like, there's this wild argument, because she covered everything, you know, was like, there's a, a claim on the Constitution, no one had heard of this thing, and of course, Linda covers, you should go find the thing in the Times archive, she covers this book. What? It's in our yeah, book. Yeah, we had, we covered the source in, in the book that we did before Roe, um, but it's just this sort of, like, a constitutional argument, right? So um, there's a New York case like that um, in which there's four different claims, one of which is the privacy argument, but it's not the dominant language in which they talk. And the Connecticut case, which part of which comes out of the basements of this building, um, also has got all of these really interesting equality arguments. There's a cruel and unusual punishment argument. There's even, they're going to make up a 19th Amendment argument. There's one of everything. Because there's no law, there's just storytelling um, about what's, what's unjust about uh, the whole here. And the first opinion that issues in the, in the Connecticut case, they cite the 19th Amendment, the ERA, Title VII, some of everything is, is in the federal report of this case, meaning it's an, a, a quality uh, inflected opinion that actually emerges out of the, the law.
the first time around. It's not a Harry Blackman opinion. It sort of heard something else that uh, you know that came out of it. So it's it's sort of at least possible to imagine a world in which what the objection was sounded differently. It sounded more um, like the voices of the women objecting than what Harry Blackman heard. But the court was just very different in those years. They hadn't decided the sex discrimination cases yet. You know, it was amazing that they heard, but they heard something distantly and remotely. And that they heard it was kind of remarkable, even, you know, because it was before, basically. It was before, it was just at the very, it's just like we're talking, it was first argued in 71, decided in 73. It was decided just as Frontiero was being argued. So it's just, just very early. And it's very, and it's very, by the time Casey has argued, it's a different world. You know, it's 20 years different and it's a different world and we're in a different world. And so it's the product of um, really uh, our fighting over what it is uh, that uh, women are citizens too, that it's been born. Um, thank you. Let's take some case them um, questions. Um, <laughs> cases, questions, stories. Uh, someone make a start? Yes. You? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I really, this is a great panel, and it's interesting. It must be a great book, so I'm looking forward this to This is Professor it. Asa Bali, who's here to visit this semester from UCLA, and it's wonderful that she's here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the panel did a great job of both placing this in the spectrum of reproductive justice, so broadening the set of questions beyond the classic reproductive rights abortion context, but also sort of a decentralized account that includes federal courts, but also state courts, different strategies, coalition building. And I wonder if we could move it even one step further and think um, internationally, because the United States is projecting its reproductive restrictive conceptions abroad, notably, obviously, through the Hyde Amendment, but beyond that, by making these frames available broadly and having them have comparative life in other domestic jurisdictions. On. So while this may not be in the book, I wonder if any of you have thoughts about what kinds of strategies that calls for in terms of solidarity, in terms of thinking broadly in policy terms about how the U.S. You know, sort of adverse impact on thinking about reproductive justice at the international level might be countered through some of the kinds of strategies that you trace in the book. Well, I'll just say it's even worse than we thought. Um, okay, was it? You, you sent around that Alex Azar statement the other day? No. No. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone sent it to you. A anyway, our secretary of HHS convened an in international. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, no. <laughs> it was in my small group. Oh, okay. <laughs> convened this, this international gathering at, at Blair House in Washington in which he was holding up as an example a light to the world Orban's Hungary for its um, claim that, you know, the family is everything. I mean, the, he said, we, we want to be like you. We, want, we don't want the international community telling us what we have to do. We want to be like, like you're doing. And I, I read this in a state of shock, actually. So... Um, we are so, we're, we're, we're allying ourselves with the real forces of darkness in the world uh, because of the obsession with, uh, you know, the unborn. And um, I, I was just left speechless with this. So that's all I can say about it. Let's see. Uh, Duncan Hosey and I have a piece in Time Magazine uh, in December uh, that traces certain um, parts of the administration. I don't want to say the whole, but the Azar meeting is coming out of uh, this interest in uh, the part of some to affiliate with uh, Orban and to converge the interest in a pronatalist policy with a hostility to immigration and uh, to really, I mean, it, it, it is a pretty, um, it's a, a pretty clearly intentional uh, convergence of two of the Make America Great Again policies, and it gives it a, a pretty clearly transnational logic. Um, 
I don't know that everyone on this commission on unalienable rights, which is carrying our the Trump administration's policy internationally is committed to that picture. I don't even know that Azar himself is committed to the picture that some are propounding when they're connecting reproductive, uh, you know, hostility to abortion to hostility to immigration. That's a deep thing to tie those two. That's very powerful, very powerful stuff. And I don't know how many of them are connected to that. Some are. Some, they've held, attended these conferences where they're making that connection, but I don't know how many of them are. You know, it's, we don't take a transnational perspective. And I think the book is probably maybe impoverished for us not having done so. We literally could only cover so many cases and lots of things got left out. Um, but we're appreciative of that. I think Julie Sook's work on this is really revelatory and she's done really remarkable comparative work looking at abortion in a lot of different jurisdictions, including Germany and Ireland. And one of the things that she points to is that in many of these jurisdictions in the constitution of these countries, there are actually affirmative protections for women as mothers. And so she thinks about the whole idea of a sort of a limiting frame. Maternity is a kind of limiting frame, but also as I think a, a lever for the state to provide more affirmative protections for families than what we have here. I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about in the reproductive rights versus reproductive justice frame is that reproductive rights, as we understand it in the United States, are primarily negative rights. The government may not do X, whereas reproductive justice envisions a more affirmative and participatory kind of posture for the state. And so Ironically, in these places where women are sort of chiefly figured as mothers and citizens, there are also these very affirmative obligations on the part of the state to actually support them in motherhood. So, and, and, and there is a tension there that I think she unpacks really nicely. I'm going to say one more thing. I think we all agree that if we were to do another edition of this book, it would be great to include a couple of chapters that take a comparative lens. Um, and I'll say that one thing we haven't talked about at all uh, on this panel is medication abortion, which I think is a really important kind of like set of both legal and medical issues. And it's kind of the next frontier, I think, in terms of the regulation of and responses on the ground to restrictive laws around abortion. So, um, and I think there's actually really important comparative work, and I'm not a comparativist, but I think in a lot of Latin American countries, for example, where there has long been very restrictive um, uh, lawmaking around abortion, but actually relatively lax regulation of certain kinds of medication. There's been a lot of on the ground sort of education and mobilization around how to get and properly administer, self-administer and self-manage medication abortions. And if we do end up in a post due medical services or, or actually, actually or functionally post Roe and Casey world in which you have these genuine reproductive rights deserts um, where there just is actually no access, um, and that this is already happening, medication abortion is going to be increasingly important. I think it is not just questions about exportation of sort of damaging U.S. policy abroad, but lessons that can be learned from what folks on the ground in these places have been doing for many decades. Yeah, I mean, that's, so that, so there's one thing is to be comparative, another is to be transnational, and to just say that, you know, what's happening here is not restricted to our territorial boundaries. And certainly when you're looking at the movement of medication abortion, it's not women on the waves, what about which Emily has written so wonderfully. Um, but also, you know, if you look at the debate so on conscience, which uh, Doug and I have uh, written a number of times and are currently publishing a piece, they flow right across borders. And if you follow the conversations about it, it's the same as looking at this Commission on Unalienable Rights, so not bounded by national borders. So we're exporting a lot of our... Uh, conflicts about this through our law, discursively, through money flows, through, you know, and how the hell, I, I, if you know the answer, I'd be all ears. <laughs> but I just might add a little, um, a, a more of a glimmer, um, given the how depressing this was. Um, so on the LGBT stuff, we're actually um, kind of ahead of um, most of the world on recognizing LGBT people's um, rights to form families and be recognized as parents. And so, and partly that's like the lack of a national healthcare system here that creates that because people are forming families and then we have to deal with actual families. Um, and people might have been following um, 
in France the the conflict over the law that would allow um, unmarried women and lesbians to access donor insemination. And the same forces that were protesting marriage equality in that country are protesting this law. If you followed the Irish marriage referendum, it became about surrogacy. There are these concerns that what you're doing is allowing forms of family formation that appear unnatural. And the US is way ahead of on that. Um, and uh, because, access, actually, it, it, because they had a yeah. national health system, yeah. there wasn't the kind of access that was here because it was private markets. Right. Sorry. And and transnationally, what's happening is people are, are coming to the U.S., forming families and then going back to their home country that treats their family formation as illegitimate and forcing the courts to actually address these families. And you've seen a movement, for instance, in the European Court of Human Rights where they've gone from being relatively... Um, affirming of countries maintaining their own laws that restrict these kinds of family formation to starting to, to give way to say, well, but these there's children that actually exist and we don't want those children to be stateless. And so they have to have some way to have their birth acknowledged and have these be their parents. And even now the French courts have said um, there has to be some pathway to parentage, which interesting is their pathway is adoption, which here gets put as the harm and not the remedy. And so that stuff is, might also change over time. Like we're arguing, oh, it's a harm to have people have to adopt their own children. There, the remedy for people is to adopt your own children. Interesting. Um, let's take another question. Hmm. I think it's been a lot. And mm -hmm. everybody's a little stunned. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will have asked one more question if no one else wants to ask one. So if we move into this um, post whole woman's health world, let's call it, in which we increasingly have a divide among states that are hospitable to abortion and states that are hostile to it, and we have these reproductive rights um, deserts, what happens next? Does the pro-choice movement change its whole strategy? Does do money and resources get to play differently? Um, I mean, we have a system of access to abortion that depends on, for the most part, standalone clinics. Um, and if you can't access one because it's hundreds of miles away, how do you get the pills for a medication abortion? Um, it's illegal in most cases for your family uh, medicine, your, your doctor to give them to you, given the um, restrictions the FDA has imposed on them here. Um, do you order them over the internet yourself? What are we going to be driving people long distances? What do you all envision? Melissa, you look like you have thoughts. Yeah, so uh, over the winter holiday, I read um, this book about the Jane Network. Um, so this is pre row about um, women basically coordinating an underground railroad to get women to abortion providers. like And training themselves to do abortions. And training themselves to do abortions. So, I mean, there is that kind of... Gilead-like world where you might do something like that. I also, but, but I think it sort of, again, gets to another theme of the book. I mean, the book consciously seeks to decenter courts from this conversation. I know I said that at Yale Law School. <laughs> <laughs> might, might be struck by lightning. Um, but, but this idea that courts are not the only interlocutor here, that there might be other actors who could make meaning, could make constitutional meaning, and could say something about what it means to have a sort of robust complement of reproductive rights. And to that end, and to the point of decentering courts, um, I think it's, it's clear that the federal courts are not the courts that our mothers would have known, or even that I would have known when I was a student here. Uh, they've changed substantially in the last three years, and they will continue to change, um, it is likely. I think one of the things that's most encouraging to me is to see all of the activism that people of your generation have done. So one of my students, um, when I was at Berkeley, started this group called Sister District, and their whole point, where well, they were focused on reproductive rights initially, but then they realized that there were all of these kinds of restrictive, not progressive laws that were being passed in state legislatures, and their goal was to identify those states where the legislature was sort of purple or indigo and had an opportunity to be turned blue, and they raised money and they sent resources to those particular state house campaigns. And their whole goal was to turn those state houses blue because 
it didn't matter if anything got to the Supreme Court if you stopped it in the first instance. Like, why worry about the court? Why not just not pass regressive laws in the first place? And so they're, they've been focusing on state legislatures. They've been focusing on city councils. Um, you know, like city councils are a hotbed for restrictions on reproductive rights. If you think about crisis pregnancy centers and the like, which are flourishing in many parts of the country, including progressive places like California. And so they're focused on that, gubernatorial elections. And that to me is really heartening. Like, you know, here we are constantly thinking about courts and they're like, I'm thinking outside of this box entirely and different kinds of constitutional and statutory actors. Yeah. I think that that in some sense is the spirit in which many of the authors did the stories in the book. There's a sense instead of law just being the stuff that courts decide, it's much more a book about law arising out of people struggling with their circumstances and problem solving and speaking up and speaking out and law in essence arising out of the struggles that emerge under those conditions. It's not a story. It's not, they're not stories about consensus. A lot of them are stories about right left conflict, but not only. And I think, you know, when I consider the circumstances in which you all are going to be learning and graduate, the worlds in which you're going to be graduating, I think it really will um, call upon you to be uh, innovative and in sort of figuring out what are new scripts and pathways and new ways in which to make the world responsive. It's plainly the only thing that you could possibly do under the circumstances. That's the spirit in which, but I mean, it seemed, it seemed as if um, this is a body of law that came into being under those circumstances and it needs to find renewal and new futures and new forms in exactly that sort of way. And some of it's gonna be in courts. There's certainly states that have courts that are open it needs new shape and it needs new voices. And in that respect, there are places to give it new form, I mean, new next generation form. But I think it's not just limited to this subject matter. There's many, many areas of law that are gonna hit um, obstruction worse uh, that would understates the case um, in the next 10 to 15 years that you guys are gonna be, you know, your first years in practice. And almost in every direction, it's gonna take thinking outside the box to think about what it is to make law grow. And so that's just what's, that's what you're going to have to think. That's what you're going to have to do. Maybe that's a great note to end on. Um, even if we didn't mean to hand the world, the legal world over to you in this state, we seem to have done so. And the stories in this book are um, an excellent template for how you might creatively figure out what to do next. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to Scylla and Teresa for making this all happen. Thank you to our amazing panelists. Um, and thank you all for your good participation and questions.